Good evening and welcome to another Saturday night edition of Night Owls. As we bask in the infrared light, I hope you enjoy the show.
If giants existed in the remote past, then Genesis 6-4 reads, There were giants in the earth in those days. They must have had customs of their own that included religious practices and traditions. Well worth knowing. Had they not been lost forever? Well, maybe not forever. Prehistory tells us all about the extinction of the dinosaurs and the unforeseen rise of brute man, the troglodyte, the neanderthal, the cro and then Homo sapiens. The prehistoric record, like the Akashic record, offers evidence of much more than that. Records of giant beings and giant earthquakes, universal deluges, stupendous volcanic explosions, incredible conflagration, and tremendous meteoric impacts. These were terrestrial and celestial events of planet-encircling magnitude, all outlined in the psychological records of mankind. The individual subconscious, or the collective unconscious, if there were humanoid creatures to witness such events as end extinctions, they must have been traumatic in the extreme. The suggestion is that events of apocalyptic dimensions result in racial trauma, cultural amnesia, and individual denial, post-traumatic disorder brought about by apocalypses. I could imagine it would just be beyond maddening. There are rich, reoccurring individual references in fringe, ancient, and occult literatures to civilizations <laughs> interior to our own. These civilizations are generally described as seafaring societies with high degree of technological expertise that in some fields surpassed our own as well as psychical attainments. Psychic attainments that beggar the imagination. I thought it said bugger the imagination. Shambhala, Mu, Lemuria, Atlantis, Avalon, Arcadia, Nuremberg. Their names resonate with the spirit and energy of poetry, with the cultures and societies that flowered in the distant past and then disappeared seemingly beneath the waters of the world fauna and flora, edifices and animals and early human beings, seemingly without leaving a trace. Like Debussy's sunken cathedral, the islet of Mount St. Michael. No doubt who the heck built that and when. The Menhirs of Karnak. They resonate in the human imagination. They are like dreams come true. Here we enter the realm of dreams. Did not Plato describe art as dreams for the, the waking mind? Canvas of the earliest days of Earth is in the dream screen of the psychoanalyst, and describing it might be what is called true dreaming or dreaming true. Dreams begets speculation, and speculation begets theories which may or may not have an air of certainty about them. There is a heritage of speculation, semi-scientific, quasi-scientific, about the face of early Earth. This is the providence of the independent thinker, who plays in modern times the role of the savant or bard of old, the custodian of tradition, who entertains his fellow human being with the tribal lays. In our time, their tales shine with the veneer of science. One of the most influential independent thinkers of the modern period is Hans Horbiger, 1860-1931. The Austrian mining engineer who proposed his once popular cosmic ice theory, Horbiger undertook his work in earnest. He regarded himself as a genius, or at least he regarded his findings as the work of genius. 
Indeed, he had no false modesty, having once boasted that he knew he was right when I knew that Newton was wrong. In 1913, he advanced his theory of the frozen cosmos to the German publication of Gesalkomogony, written in collaboration with Philip Fawthen. His book was widely reprinted, though curiously, it never appeared in an English translation. There are two reasons why his work is of present-day interest. First, his philosophy is an instance of a theory contrary to fact, like the flat earth theory or the hollow earth theory. Second, it is an example of the occult thought that attracted the interest of the Nazi theoreticians and ideologues, especially Heinrich Himmler who on behalf of the Third Reich incorporated the cosmic ice theory into Aryan science. For these reasons, its influence was initially limited to the German-speaking world. Indeed, the English-speaking world kept the cosmic ice theory at arm's length. In post-war years, it attracted the interest of a handful of dissident thinkers in England, and their interest sparked that of Seurat, who in turn kindled an interest in these ideas among the French reading public. All in all, Seurat was the most respectable and the most prominent spokesman for such thought in any language, and they only won with an independent reputation as a writer and educator. Now, scanning down further on here, I noticed he's got... Uh, this written, and you can easily, uh, I'm thinking along the lines of Saturn theory, but um, Horbiger is the guy who's got the successive moons crashing into the earth, his glacial cosmology. Apparently he must have been a German, and, you know, but uh, this is a pretty good little read here. This presents a new development, stimulating and provocative of the theories advanced in a well-known series of books by H.S. Bellamy and Peter Allen. Like Mr. Bellamy and Mr. Allen, Professor Surratt accepts the glacial cosmology of Horbiger. Its theories of successive satellites crashing into the Earth, or crashing to the Earth, and subsequent global cataclysm. In these events, Professor Surratt argues, are to be found not only the origins of some of our major myths, Atlantis, for example, but also an explanation of certain puzzling anthropological remains of superhuman size. Can it have been, he asks, the gravitation pull of our tertiary satellite induced both gigantism and longevity? If so, what happened after the subsequent catastrophe? During a golden age, can ordinary men have walked the earth under the benevolent tutelage of good giants? And did these good giants degenerate into the ogres of legend? The answers suggested by Professor Seurat created wide interest when the book was first published in France. I read it, wrote M. Jean Cocteau, with much more than my eyes alone. In this country, too, where Professor Surratt's work is almost equally well known, Atlantis and the Giants will be recognized as a notable contribution to Horbigerian lit literature. In one of Horbiger's books, I do believe he's got live fish falling from the sky and lo and behold it even happens to this day apparently in these spouts that we call tornadoes but they call type professor Surratt is a daring thinker impatient of provisional conclusions all his books from the philosophical dialogues written when he was a young man 
to that very remarkable book founded on personal experience, The End of Fear, show the same exciting quality in his latest volume, which has created wide interest in France. He develops the glacial cosmology of the Austrian scientist Horbiger and his followers, Mr. H. S. Bellamy and Peter Allen. His theory replaces the picture of a slow and humdrum evolution of the Earth by a violent and cataclysmic one. It describes terrestrial ages in which three moons in succession revolve so close to the Earth that to quote Professor Surratt, they outshone the sun, being very much larger and later circled the earth several times a day. Well, now you know we could just replace those moons for planets, because like the moon said, they're going to have an uplifting effect on the earth. All of a sudden, everything's going to be lighter. People are going to grow a lot bigger, animals, and later crashed on the earth and destroyed all nations. The attraction exerted by these moons was so great that it gathered the waters of the earth into a great bulge around the equator. That would be the absolute, I would imagine. <sighs> Professor Surratt believes that they brought two golden ages to mankind, for he holds that man was not born until toward the last phase of the second moon, perhaps 15 million years ago. During first and the second golden age, high civilizations existed, fostered by benevolent moons, so this would be our third time around. I've heard that before. Then the moon crashed, and the piled up waters at the equator poured north and south, inundating islands and continents. It was on an earth left by the territory catastrophe that our own modestly attractive moon rose. Horbiger's theory of glacial cosmology is not officially accepted by scientists. Yet the Horbigerian theory does seem to give a reasonable explanation for more things than the official one. For instance, the gigantic plants and the huge fossilized animals. Professor Surratt points out an organism plant or animal buried normally today does not fossilize. It rots away. Fossils must have been formed by extraordinary pressures, such perhaps as the crash of a moon. And there are the stories, records, Professor Surratt would call them, of a giant race. He believes that the giants really existed, and he has an ingenious explanation for them. When those earlier moons circled close to the Earth, the gravitation exerted by them lessened the weight of all creatures, drawing them upward. Living things grew taller, and the giant race was born when the moon crashed. Professor Surratt believes that some of the giants escaped and later became the teachers of their high civilization to ordinary mankind. They lived to fabulous ages. In Greece, long after their death, they became gods or titans. But on giants, Professor Surratt relies mostly on the Bible, for there are the described objectively, without any theological coloring, since Jehovah, the one true God, could not admit companions or rivals the Horbigerian theory does provide a possible explanation for the appearance of giants and the creation of man. 
the atmospheric conditions, let us say, on the other hand, a golden age when men were taught and ruled by wise giants is perhaps nothing more than a pleasing imagination. The Aztec Huitzilopochtli. I finally got that one down. Also in North America, Coyote and Raven, but countless others as well. Because the warrior hero is far and away the most active figure in the myths. Next is the Primal Seven. These satellite figures are presented in a variety of contexts as wise men, patriarchs, seers, children, dwarves, stones of fate, stars, orbs, heads of chaos monster. They are the first reason for the sanctity of the number seven in ancient symbolism. Then we have the chaos monster. Here we meet the darker, more menacing powers possessing the often hidden link to aspects of the mother goddess or warrior type hero, warrior hero type. Of these darker creatures, none is more prominent than the cosmic serpent or dragon, the monster that descends on the wide over the twilight of the gods, and whose ultimate defeat signals the birth of a new age, or symbolically, a new year. Babylonian Tiamat, Egyptian dragon of Apep, Greek Typhon, but within every culture endless variations will be found, hundreds of monsters, repeating the primeval catastrophe each providing a different nuance, a different accent, a different way of remembering the cosmic agent of Doomsday. Then we have Chaos Hordes. These are the companions of the monster figures. Set. Every culture remembered the onslaught of these Chaos Demons, moving across the heavens as a, a sky-darkening cloud and ushering in the cosmic nominated form of his own father. Examples would include the Egyptian Osiris, Marduk, the Persian Ahura, Mazda, Norse Balder, Hebrew Yahweh, of the gods. Their brutal and ritualistic wars of expansion, celebrated as a reptilian or as a repetition of the cosmic devastation wrought in wars of the gods. The gods' motives, as these constitute, in fact, the most readily verifiable underpinnings of ancient ritual, myth, and symbol. How strange that in their incessant glance backwards, the builders of the first civilizations never remembered anything resembling the natural world in which we live. What is needed in the face of usual but widely repeated memories is brutal intellectual honesty. How did human consciousness emerge from the womb of nature, converge on the same improbable ideas contradicting nature? For centuries we've lived under the illusion that our ancestors simply made up explanations of natural phenomena they didn't understand. That's not the problem. What the myth makers interpreted or explained through stories and symbols and ritual reenactments is an unrecognizable world, a world of alien sights and sounds, of celestial forms of cosmic spectacles and earth-shaking events that do not occur in our world. That is the problem. From an evaluation of the global themes of ancient cultures, we have hypothesized a world order never imagined by mainstream theory, a world in which planets moved on different courses, appearing huge in the sky, heavens spanning celestial forms dominated human imagination to the point of obsession at the time of civilization's birth.
historical synopsis of Saturnian cosmology from John Cook's website, saturniancosmology.org. There will be a link in the description. He gets pretty deep. The chapters of this site will propose that the biology of our planet, our culture, our psychology, and our very existence are the result of a series of incidents arising from the interaction between Earth and other planets within the solar system, most notably Saturn. The biology of Earth is such that a complete accident, and so utterly unlike it will not have ever been duplicated anywhere at any time among the billions of other star systems. But here on Earth, all of it, especially the rise of complex species since the Cambrian period 560 million years ago, can be attributed to a series of cataclysmic plasma strikes by Saturn, each of a very long duration. Biologists claim 10,000 years for the extinction events. My original estimate was 15,000 years. As hominids, we survived the last externally induced extinction event, which gave rise to eight competing subspecies over the course of the last three million years. Our only contribution to our distinction from other animals was the invention 10,000 years ago of language and its subsequent cultural transmission that set the stage for further development of our humanity. Much later on, and much closer to our time, subjective consciousness. It all started very long ago, at one time, and from its genesis, Earth was a planet in orbit around Saturn, a brown dwarf star, toward the end of the Precambrian, 600 million years ago. The Saturnian system intersected with the solar system. Saturn was swept around the sun and back into deep space to return at regular 26 to 27 million year intervals. Over the course of time, some of the satellites, planets of Saturn, were wrenched from their orbits around Saturn to end up revolving around the Sun instead. The Earth likely became a solar system planet at the end of the Permian 250 million years ago. From 600 million years ago, Saturn kept entering the solar system regularly to disturb its lost satellites, now circling the Sun. At about 3 million years ago, Saturn likely had a run-in with Jupiter, a solar system planet at that time, orbiting the Sun at a distance probably somewhat less than the Earth's orbit today. The orbital period of Saturn was significantly reduced as a result. During the last 3 million year period, Saturn started scavenging its lost satellites, and perhaps solar system planets, all in orbit close to the Sun. The possibility of a captured planet again orbiting Saturn at its equator is virtually nil. Instead, the scavenged planets ended up in superpolar or subpolar locations, the only locations which seem to be dynamically stable. Because Saturn had come in from outside of the solar system, and most likely was a star originally, it would have been at a very high positive charge level, distinct from the solar system planets. Solar system planets would have been attracted to Saturn when Saturn entered the solar system, rather than be repelled as would be the case of two planets with nearly equal values of charge. Saturn with its stack of captured planets was seen by hominids Homo erectus and recorded in the shapes of artifacts in the Paleolithic of about two million years ago, and by humans Homo sapiens as carved images in the Upper Paleolithic from 30,000 BC and by the hundreds of millions during the Early Neolithic 10,000 to 3,000 BC when the stack of planets was much more frequently seen. At about 10,900 BC Earth, at that time a planet of the Sun, made an electric field contact with Saturn, causing 1500 years of darkness. Oh yeah, shadow on Earth. The period of darkness is recognized by many of the world's creation myths, and was recorded in the illustrated graphic books of Mesoamerica, references to which are made in colonial period documents. Climatologically, the period is identified today as the Younger Dryas, when for some 1500 years Earth got as cold as it had ever been. 
Over the next 7,000 years, the orbit of Earth, apparently equal to the orbit of Saturn at that time, but below Saturn, progressively moved laterally to have Earth's orbital path eventually travel below the center of Saturn. Thus, between 10,900 BC and 3147 BC, Earth was part of a strange configuration of stacked planets, a condition which provided long summers and a mild climate in the northern hemisphere. Planets dominated by the giant form of Saturn stood above the north, the north horizon and close to Earth, but measured in millions of miles, and were taken by humans to be gods, who supported them and for whose benefit they labored at agriculture and conducted trade. Initially, during a 1500-year period after 10,900 BC, when the cold of the Younger Dryas set in, and long before Saturn was clearly seen, three fiercely lighted ball plasmoids were seen far south of Earth. Below the South Pole, between about 10,900 BC and 8347 BC, these connected to Saturn and the North via strands of brilliant arcs of electrons. Forms of various shapes ran south over these electron lines, traveling toward the three plasmoids. The moving shapes were taken to be dead animals and dead humans. The objects in the sky became the basis for all original religions and a good deal of mythology throughout the world, for they persisted in showing nightly and seasonally over the course of 2500 years to 8347 BC, although only for three periods of hundreds of years. For the people of Mesoamerica, the year 8347 BC, when the last of the plasmoids extinguished after 2500 years, was the end of their first tally of years, which accounted for the first creation. We know only a little about these ball plasmoids from obscure mythological references, and we would still not know very much if it had not been for an investigation undertaken by a team led by Anthony Pratt of Las Alamos National Labs of some four million petroglyphs worldwide, carved high up on mountainsides facing in all directions, but always with a clear view toward the south. That study, published in the journal IEEE Transactions on Plasma Science, in 2003, was an absolutely astounding revelation. More on that in a later chapter. In 4077 BC, Saturn dropped its coma. This had been the chaos before creation, which had lasted some 7,000 years. It had obscured Saturn and its companion satellites. Saturn went nova. It switched to arc mode in a mass expulsion, Saturn produced its rings and a new satellite, Venus, and perhaps another. That's interesting. So they're saying that Venus came from Saturn and not Jupiter, like Golikovsky does. Okay. And Saturn lit up more brilliantly than the sun to the humans of Earth, who had not clearly seen the real sun for thousands of years because of the shadow of the Younger Dryas, followed by the obscurity of the enclosing plasma sphere of Saturn. This was the start of creation, start of time, and the first showing of the land and its resident gods, the satellites of Saturn. Saturn was universally called the sun throughout the world. In Central America, the Papal Vu, written circa AD 1600, from much older records, recounts, like a man was the sun when it showed itself. It showed itself when it was born and remained fixed in the sky like a mirror. Certainly it was not the same sun which we see. It is said in their old tales. In arc mode, Saturn would have lost its glow mode coma, but it apparently retained a plasma stream connection to Earth. The sun, and the real sun, lighted part of the edge of Saturn in a crescent, which revolved around Saturn on a daily basis, visually caused by a daily rotation of Earth below Saturn. This stack of planets consisted from top to bottom of Uranus, on its side as today, and Neptune, both hidden by Saturn below them, known in Mesoamerica from earlier times. I suspect that these three planets had been seen together for perhaps two million years, 
initially by Homo erectus. Below Saturn, the following were located from top to bottom. Mercury joined the group in about 14,000 BC. Mars, resident probably since at least 30,000 BC or earlier, and Earth joined the group after 10,900 BC. In 3147 BC, this configuration of standing planets broke apart, with three large planets moving far away from the Sun, and Earth, and Venus, released to overlapping inner orbits. The breakup produced a stupendous flood of the waters, which had been held at the south polar region due to the gravitational attraction of Saturn for some 7,000 years. The water held at the south pole was due to the lifting up of the Earth's crust in the Arctic and the sinking toward the Earth's interior in the Antarctic. Flood stories are ubiquitous, found in over 500 independent myths, all with the same coherent details. The survivors included people far inland and those living already on mountain slopes. And apparently, the people of the Nile Delta and northern Mesopotamia. The only recourse to a livelihood for many of the survivors was agriculture, which soon sprang up simultaneously in six unconnected regions of Earth. The breakup was caused by Jupiter, which had circled the Sun as an inner planet up to that time. Jupiter was subsequently seen receding in the skies, surrounded by a coma visually three times larger than the diameter of the moon today. Below the south pole of Jupiter extended a gigantic plasma outpouring, making it look like Jupiter was resting on a mountain. It was green initially. Above the planet were much smaller horn-like extensions. The whole of this looked like a person in a mantle, but was also identified as the bowl of heaven. Jupiter was taken as the new god, called the Younger. Jupiter retained its massive lower outpouring until it entered the asteroid belt in about 2860 BC, after which the coma reduced in size and changed its shape. After 3070 BC, Mars and Mercury, which had remained in their positions below Saturn, were released when Saturn entered the asteroid belt. The two planets crossed Earth's orbit for about 300 years, overriding the Earth's orbit close to Earth on a 30-year or 15-year average intervals. At those times, Mars was at times brought into plasma contact with Earth, looking like a squat mountain which circled the Earth. The visual effect of the rotation of Earth with Saturn and Jupiter both disappearing into the ecliptic. Mars was held to be the god in charge of Earth, Horus of the Egyptians. This lasted till about 2750 BC or 2700 BC, after which the regular visits of Mars ended its elliptical orbit, perhaps rotating away from Earth, an apocidal procession. In the next century, people throughout the world start building pyramids in imitation of the disappeared mountain of Mars, all within a hundred years of each other, in Egypt, Mesopotamia, England, China, and the Andes of South America and many other locations such as Greece and the Balkans, as has been discovered in recent years, although not validated. We have recorded histories of these celestial events, especially in Mesoamerica. There are accurate descriptions of the rings and the number of satellites of Saturn, the cloud bands and satellites of Jupiter, and the scarred surface and satellites of Mars all dating from antiquity spanning cultures worldwide. The Egyptians produced schematic images of the original configuration of Saturn and the satellite planets below and have a record of early close passes by Mars. Mesopotamians also produced images of planets, graphically showing, for example, all the satellites of Jupiter. The Maya, from Olmec sources, have an undated record of the planetary movements from long before 3147 BC, and a dated record of later events which matches what can be gleaned from Eastern Mediterranean sources. The Aztecs produced graphic images of these planets, although anthropomorphized, to gods and produced very late. South Sea Islanders have similar records of rings of Saturn. India has similar recollection of these events extending over millions of lines of poetry. The Quiche, Maya, Papa Vu, and pages of the Maya books of the Chilambalam 
makes casual reference to the period of 13,000 years ago. After the near collision of Saturn and Jupiter in 3147 BC, both Saturn and Jupiter began moving in slow spiral orbits away from the Sun toward the asteroid belt. Probably 10,900 BC. One page of the Chelum Balam records seven appearances of the Saturnian planets as far back as perhaps 40,000 years, which can be collated with atmospheric carbon-14 records dating from 50,000 BP. Over the next 2,500 years, 3147 BC to 685 BC, the inner planets interfered with Earth at intervals, although very infrequently. There were four major additional incidents. The damage often was localized in latitude, although, for example, a continuous lightning strike might have encircled the globe in circa 1492 BC, and certainly repeatedly in the 8th and 7th century BC. As recalled by nearly all peoples on all continents, the most terrifying incident, however, happened in 2349 BC. Saturn, with the planets Mars and Mercury, still in a polar alignment below, entered the asteroid belt in 3067 BC. The gravitational and electrical effects of entering the asteroid belt released Mars and Mercury from below Saturn, and they started moving in highly elliptical orbits. These orbits brought both planets back through the asteroid belt at their aphelions, and Mars and Mercury pulled swarms of objects of various sizes from the belt back with them through the inner solar system. These objects were known as Maruts, or the Terrible Ones, and manifested as comets and meteorites that terrorized the Earth's population for many centuries to come. When in alignment with Venus, 20 million miles away at the time, 32,200,000 kilometers, produced an Earth shock in the northern hemisphere, tilting the Earth's axis away from the Sun temporarily and tilting up the equatorial rings of the Earth. Earth at one time had equatorial rings. This was followed perhaps six hours later by the arrival of a massive disconnected plasmoid lightning bolt from Venus, which hit the rings almost broadside, followed somewhat later by lesser bolts recorded in Mesoamerica and China. The electric contact with Venus turned the equatorial rings blood red and caused the destruction of the rings. Lightning bolts arc up to the rings from the Earth's ionosphere layers and the lower equatorial plasma toroid, the Van Allen belt. The sky bled for three days and only a single ring remained. Thus continued to rain down for the next 4,000 years until AD 1600. The cleared southern skies previously obscured by the Earth's rings revealed a multitude of stars for the first time, most notably the Pleiades, located directly south at midnight, two nights after the equinox. The equatorial plasma toroid would have also arced to the surface of Earth, producing months of torrential rains. To humanity, the sea of the Earth's equatorial rings in the south sky, the Absu, had collapsed to Earth and the event was almost everywhere understood as a second flood of stupendous proportion. The Bible recalls this event as the flood of Noah, but to most peoples, the blood seen in the sky suggested the wholesale slaughter of humanity, and any number of raging goddesses or dragons were assigned to this event in mythology worldwide. Kali, Tiamat, Anath, Sekhmet, Hathor, and much later, Beowulf's Grindel. After two and a half days, Jupiter appeared again with its previous giant coma and lower mantle, again understood as a mountain, as if risen from the dead. In fact, the rise of the equatorial in the sky made it look as if Jupiter rose up out of the cave previously seen as the shadow of the Earth on the rings. The cave-shaped shadow opened up as the Earth regained its normal inclination, and Jupiter rose out of this to a location above it. Jupiter had stopped the dragon from killing additional humans. The event itself remains commemorated as the Day of the Dead, which is why they wear Halloween masks on Halloween. It's so that the spirits don't recognize them, the ones that might want revenge. I believe that's what that's about. And is almost universally associated with the culmination of the Pleiades in autumn. Echoes of the fall of the rings and the surrounding circumstances 
continued to resound in mythology and to this day in the theologies and practices of many religions, especially the resurrection of Jupiter on the third day. Many nations also date the start of all sensible history and their calendars from this event. Strangely, this event is simply not noted by any of the catastrophists. Even Velikovsky remained unaware of it. Hmm, interesting. 800 years later, in 1492 BC, Venus again made an electric contact with Earth, causing a crushing repulsive blow in the East Central Pacific. The Pacific Islands were wiped clean of any trace of humans, except for the petroglyphs carved on every island thousands of years earlier. Coastal South America and Central America were inundated with water, leaving seawater traces in lakes high up in the Andes, and possibly causing a sudden rise in the coastal range of the Andes by thousands of feet. The blow was followed by an electric arc traveling through the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, and part of India, following a path of increasingly higher latitude into the Mediterranean as the Earth's axis angled back toward the Sun. Moses made his escape from Egypt during the turmoil. The event is recalled in mythology as the attack of the monster Typhon, who was struck down by Zeus. The major result of the contact was a 30% increase in the orbit of the Earth. The year went from 273 days to 360 days. Venus probably came no closer than 10 million miles. In this instance, 16 million kilometers. Something else was initiated at this time. The movement of tribes away from devastated areas and failing climates into new regions happened after 1492 BC. Tribes of Central Asia entered India, Anatolia in Greece. Tribes from Asia Minor settled in Italy, as well as at later dates also. People everywhere met strangers, and had to cope with new living conditions. This resulted in an expansion of our imagination as a way of coping with these changes. The development of subjective consciousness. Before this time, there was little need to deal with change. The people of Egypt and Mesopotamia, for whom we have records, have remained stagnant in the way of life of their forebears. For thousands upon thousands of years. The development of subjective consciousness, as opposed to mere consciousness, was a cultural innovation and a major change which made us humans. Subjective consciousness came to be taught to children by parents, exactly like language is taught. The teaching of subjective consciousness, like the teaching of language, can be readily observed today. Note 5. Another 700 years later, 806 BC to 687 BC, Mars closed in on Earth with repeated electric arc contact at 15-year intervals. A major Earth shock in 747 BC and a minor shock in 686 BC, this last caused by Mercury. Earlier, Mars also interfered with Earth in a similar fashion at the close of the early Bronze Age, 1935 to circa 1700 BC, which includes the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Mars came close, perhaps within 40,000 miles of Earth. The interactions, as a result, were completely different from the long-distance shock due to Venus. The destructions of the 8th and 7th century BC were spread over long stretches from Central Asia to the Western Mediterranean and through to Mexico and Southern United States. From the Persian Plateau to Greece, in swaths measuring more than 600 miles wide, hilltop citadels were destroyed by quick-like convulsions much more extensive than any earthquake, and by massive lightning strikes. Cities and citadels were buried under yards of carbonized material mixed with soil. The soil and burned forest were dropped whenever the traveling lightning bolt paused at a hilltop. Now that's pretty crazy. I mean, this lightning bolt traveling around just going anywhere. These simultaneous destructions have been noted in the archaeological record and include the events of the 8th and 7th century as well as 1935 BC. De Grazia estimates that only 2.5% of the original population of 200 million of the Mediterranean region survived. Bolsena, a city in Italy, was obliterated by a lightning bolt measuring more than 5 miles 8 kilometers in, in diameter. If we are to believe plenty who presents this from older Etruscan sources. The circular lake at Bolsena, the circular lake at Bolsena is larger than any volcanic caldera. Mars became the next sky god to set a tone for human conduct lasting this day. 
the destructions of the 8th and 7th century BC obliterated the coastal areas of Greece and coastal Anatolia. The remnant population turned to raiding and became the pirates celebrated in the Iliad as the Egyptian people of the sea. The Iliad reveals that these were no sailors. Warfare and the extraction of tribute also became a way of life for the Assyrians, who plundered from Elam to Egypt. The change in humanity, however, which suddenly brought up, brought people up to our current expectations, was an event which happened early in the 7th century BC. In 685 BC, Venus and Mercury blazed as bright as the sun and were seen in the daytime skies with the sun for 40 days starting on June 15th. The event was probably an extraordinary plasma outpouring by the sun, brought on by a sudden relocation of Mercury to within the orbit of Venus in the previous year. In July 685 BC, actually the astronomical year minus 685, corrected from 680 BC, Julian in the Eastern Mediterranean chronology. Ah, okay, so that's what the minus is for. It's different. It's astronomical. Okay. Jupiter also erupted with a coma in response in Jupiter also erupted in a coma in response to the sun's increased output of plasma. And on July 14th, sent a return lightning stroke. A plasmoid bolt headed for the sun. It arrived at the sun on July 25th. The plasmoid, which, which passed by the Earth at a distance of 30 million miles, 48 million kilometers, was seen in foreshortened form by Asia and Europe. How about that Jupiter taking a swing at the sun? <laughs> and is depicted in sculptures and illustrations and even on coins. Mediterranean nations thought that Venus or Mercury was struck the bolt from Zeus which toppled Phaethon from the sun's chariot. Mesoamerica saw the plasmoid at full length as it passed by in the daytime. That would be wild to see something like that and depicted it correspondingly differently. Their understanding was that Mars was struck. It was called the bundle of flame. Among the Maya, to China this was the celestial dragon, the traditional form of which matches the structure of a plasmoid lightning bolt. Note 6. One could spend a lot of hours on this website here with this. This is amazing. Um, got a little bit more to go here. As experienced by Earth, the after effect of the 40 days of extreme solar activity was the relocation of the polar axis from Ursa Major to near Ursa Minor and the delay of spring by some 15 days. In effect, changing the inclination of the polar axis which is equivalent to rotating the dome of the stars. A new equinox was suddenly established, the aphelion of the Earth's orbit. The location furthest from the Sun changed, and 120 years of interference by Mars and Mercury came to a sudden halt. It appeared to many that Jupiter, the historical supreme god of antiquity, had again saved mankind from destruction. The change in aphelion had resulted in a cessation of further interactions with Mars. In 670 BC, the Earth's orbit became nearly circular for unknown reasons. And the Earth was in fact completely removed from any future interference by any of the inner planets. It's probably the Sun's uh, magnetic sphere, I imagine. Within 100 years of this event, we see the simultaneous rise of philosophical studies, much as we understand them today. In China, India, Mesopotamia, Anatolia, North Africa, and Rome. Well before there was any cultural transmission before the more distant regions on the list, in this list. It appeared to many as if a far greater power beyond the dome of the stars had moved the stars and planets and restarted the universe. For many years of the philosophers, the causes for natural phenomena were now sought elsewhere than in the whims of old planetary gods. With the realization of the existence of a power beyond the planets and stars, we also see the sudden rise of all the modern religions within the span of 100 years. Taoism and Confucianism in China, Jainism and Buddhism in India, with its subsequent influence on Hinduism, 
Zoroastrianism in Persia. With its influence on Judaism, Mithraism, Christianity, and eventually on Islam. Similar changes seem to be attested to in Mesoamerica, probably dating from 600 BC. Could all this really have happened? Religions have attempted to explain all of it, initially as narrations of the observed events, eventually as metaphors of spiritual states. Science, on the other hand, has spent the last 200 years denying that anything at all ever happened. But look at the histories, what we call myths of people from regions as diverse as China, Mesopotamia, and Mesoamerica will reveal that they are in complete agreement with each other. Add to these various myths of the people of India, South America, Africa, Greece, and thousands of others, and a consistent picture of the past emerges, which is not what science tells us. Or flyover regions, for example, of the western United States, and you will soon be convinced that the waves of hills the conical dumps of wind-borne soil, the distorted folded mountains, the widely varied landscape cannot possibly be the result of eons of slow movement and metamorphosis of the Earth's crust. The surface of the Earth appears to have been battered and racked convulsively in widely varied landscape and recently. Except for geology, which I will not really touch on, the remaining chapters will fill in the details and broaden the scope for major events. The four events are the end of the Age of the Gods and the worldwide flood of 3147 BC, the fall of the Absu, known as the Flood of Noah, the blood in the sky, the resurrection of Jupiter and the first appearance of the Pleiades, 2349 BC, the defeat of Typhon and the exodus of Moses from Egypt in 1492 BC, and the blazing of Venus and Mercury and the thunderbolt of Jupiter which toppled Phaethon in 685 BC. The last few chapters present an excursion into the site plans and iconography of Mesoamerica from about 2000 BC. In these last chapters you will find that the more closely detailed findings from Mesoamerica will match and often exceed the information available from the Eastern Mediterranean.
The South Atlantic Anomaly This very unique region of the Earth has been expanding for over a decade and a half, according to scientists. The scientists are beginning to think that it's splitting into two distinct zones. While the anomaly poses little risk to life here on Earth, Apparently, it allows scientists to look under the layers at the complex system of Earth's magnetism. They, according to mainstream science, about 1,800 miles under the surface, dynamic processes inside of Earth's iron magnetic core continues to be generating electric current. How about that? This accounts for the majority of Earth's magnetic field. Wow, that's pretty crazy. Mainstream is admitting it, but unlike that of a bar magnet that only has one north and one south pole, Earth's magnetic field is not very neat or tidy. If we take a look below the anomaly at the boundary separating the core and the mantle, the magnetic variations seem to be much stronger. This picture provides a clear link between the anomaly we see in Earth's magnetic field, its origins deep within Earth's interior, and how it will be projected to evolve in the near future. Earth's magnetic field, it is known, plays a huge role in shaping Earth's environment. In addition to guiding compasses and animal migration, Earth's magnetic field is our shield against cosmic rays, propelling charged particles coming from the sun. See, they're starting making baby steps. Sun particles that could be very disruptive if they were to reach the surface. Many of the particles that do slip through the shield become trapped in large rings of energetic particles known as the Van Allen belts, which is theorized to be held in place by Earth's magnetic field. The inner edge of the innermost belt is about 400 miles from the surface of the Earth at the equator, which keeps particle radiation a good distance from Earth and orbiting satellites. 
Because of an apparent offset between Earth's magnetic and rotational bowls and the weakened magnetic field above the North Atlantic anomaly, some energetic particles in the belts do reach the Earth's surface. This means that NASA has to account for the extra radiation when in orbit around the Earth for when they pass through the anomaly. NASA researchers are using data from satellites along with their theoretical models to track the evolution of the South Atlantic anomaly and to help prepare for future satellites for humankind in space. solar system. Jupiter, the grandest of all the sun's planets, a gas giant so large every other planet could easily fit inside its vast bulk. Jupiter has 67 moons, four of them being large terrestrial moons. Jupiter is a virtual mini solar system within the sun's own solar system. A new theory suggests Jupiter may once have been a minor star in its own right, originally locked in a binary-like relationship with the Sun, with only the small planet Mercury present at that time amongst the other seven planets that we see in the solar system today. This theory suggests that before the arrival and capture of at least five other alien planets, Jupiter orbited its position much closer into the Sun than it is today, in an orbit that placed it well within the Sun's habitable zone, and made possible the idea that at least three of Jupiter's sticks with brown dwarf stars, a class of substellar object that is believed to have not accumulated enough mass in its core to spark the nuclear fusion reaction supposedly needed to transform them into stars like our Sun or so the theory goes. Yet Jupiter, and Saturn for that matter, both display undeniable star-like qualities not expected of planets. Jupiter is warmer at its poles than at its equator, as is Saturn. Jupiter emits X-rays and radio waves, a trait of regular stars and brown dwarf stars. Saturn's rings have been seen to fairly crackle with electrical activity on occasion and both planets are very fast rotators, like the Sun. All this suggests that both Jupiter and Saturn share more in common with the formation of brown dwarf stars than they do with the accepted model of planetary formation, which claims all planets are accreted fragments of inert dust and gases found in a star's primordial circumstellar disk. In fact, so unexpectedly star-like are these two planets that, on closer inspection, their physical and dynamic compositions are obviously at odds with the accretion disk model, 
a model that mainstream science says is responsible for the diverse and oddly different physical makeups of the eight known planets that currently orbit the Sun. A comparison between Jupiter and a brown dwarf star can serve to illustrate the feasibility of such an assessment, that is, that Jupiter may have started out life as a brown dwarf, and that this brown dwarf may have enjoyed a much closer and warmer relationship to the Sun in times past. Brown dwarf stars are difficult objects for scientists to classify. Being much cooler than main sequence stars like our Sun, they are hard to detect in the outer reaches of space when using standard optical astronomy equipment. To the naked eye, a brown dwarf star does not look brown at all. In fact, it will most likely appear as a cool red or glowing magenta colored body due to the spectrum of light it produces and be enveloped with a turbulent, dense, gaseous atmosphere very similar to a gas giant planet. The sizes of brown dwarf stars also pose a problem to many scientists. There is debate as to when an object stops being a gas giant planet and becomes a brown dwarf star. A contributing factor to this problem is the confusion often generated by mistaking mass for volume. A brown dwarf star may appear to be roughly the size of the planet Jupiter, but hold much more mass or material. While on the other hand, a different brown dwarf star may appear to be hugely larger or more voluminous than a planet like Jupiter, but be only the same size in terms of its material mass. A solution to this problem can be illustrated by the size of Jupiter's own intrinsic magnetosphere which is the most powerful within the solar system. So large is Jupiter's magnetosphere that if it was rendered as an opaque glowing object in our night sky, it would appear to us to be the size of our full moon. Jupiter's magnetosphere is, of course, transparent, an electrical consequence of its position within the Sun's even more massive magnetosphere, commonly called the heliosphere. called uh, Nakhmani, which everybody knows is the Hill of Manes. We're talking about the first pharaoh of the first dynasty. We're way back, way back 4,000 years BC in terms of even Egyptian mythology. And these are strong connections, but they've been suppressed by this, uh, the elite and the establishment authors. And yet, if you know where to go, like I do, you'll find academics who will concede every point I'm making. People like Lorraine Evans, who wrote the book Kingdom of the Ark, and uh, people of that ilk. There are people who admit this, but they're hard to find. And, you know, my work is partly largely based on locating this evidence uh, from academic sources, you know, that are credible sources, E.A. Wallace Budge and, and uh, so many other people we could mention. Mm. So, yeah, and the key to it, like you said, is w with stuff of this nature, um, you really need to go off road like to try to get to the bottom of things straight away. And um, yeah, so so they're only going back a few thousand years. And even, you know, when we're looking at the, the sites that you mentioned, they're the obvious kind of giveaways, you know, like when you're looking at Newgrange, you know, we've all been there, been there myself recently, and it doesn't take much to kind of immediately make people it should be obvious and make people think straight away that the official story isn't quite cutting it here it's quite right i mean there's nothing that we're saying that's spurious at all if you go to these sites and the astronomical the geomantic precision they don't even know how to build a corbel structure in new grange is a ceiling that nobody on earth can build just like they can't build a sarcophagus that they find in saqqara or even the king's coffer and the great pyramid well look forget egypt Forget the flicking Sumerians. Let's just deal with Ireland, what's on our doorstep, and then spill over into, you know, features that you see in Wales and other parts of England. Avebury, Stonehenge. There's thoughts that even some of the stones in Stonehenge could actually come from County Kildare in Ireland. What the hell is going on? There's enough mystery. But the thing is, a lot of that mystery has been extrapolated by the people that I deal with. My whole Irish origins work 
was uh, just simply started off as a dedication to Commons Beaumont, right? Who was, uh, you know, a great mentor of mine, an Englishman who went to every headland and every <laughs> conceivable site in the British. Who's ever heard of this guy? You know, these Johnny Come Latelys in today's world, Random House is printing them. You know, these people are taking the credit. There's not a thing that they're iterating that hasn't already been iterated by my major people in the past, like Commons Beaumont, Connor McAdory, Ignatius Donnelly, and Anna Wilkes, and a bevy of other great people. They're just reiterating their stuff, but they've airbrushed the name of these greats out. My job is to go back as a purist and resurrect the work of, of a Conor McDory or Emmanuel Velikovsky, because it, 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 it's, to me, dreadful and obnoxious that their names are forgotten. So there's many elements to my work. It's not just the pure history or pushing the boundaries and being, you know, controversial and, and, and being a maverick. And that's all part of it, but it's a minor part of it. The, the basic motive of my work in, in this regard, you know, what we're talking about, and in every other field that I deal with, is to make sure that graves are not left unattended because great, great minds broke the consensus in the 1800s and the 1900s to bring forth this information. What are we going to do? Just forget about it and wait till some Johnny come lately, or, you know, packages it in a, and it's in Waterstone's freaking window, and then, that, then it's all right. Then you can accept it or it's on Channel 4 or whatever. No, that's not satisfactory. I'm glad for that. I'm glad that those productions exist. I'm dead glad those books exist. But by no means should somebody think that that's where it started in the 1980s with the Da Vinci, you know, the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail or whatever else you've got in the 90s. This thing, this study goes right back to the turn of the century. And some of the finest work was done then. And I never lose sight of that. You see, whether it's to do with ley lines or the history of Ireland or the history of the church and the suppression and all the rest of it. There's such a story to be told here. And then the, maybe the other motive for me was the fact that I was incensed that the more I read from a Geoffrey Keating, you know, some of the ancient books of Ireland, the Annals of Ireland, the, the ancient uh, chronicles of uh, Scotland, I started to become aware then that we've got another problem, and that is that uh, uh, the, not only are the greats being suppressed, but there's a story here of desecration, and that in almost every book I've read, even if it happens to be on the Druids or, you know, the history of Ireland, the destruction of the Druidic culture is a footnote in almost all the books, not all, but, you know, books that people would never have heard of. Maybe it's it's done a little bit better with, but these are out of print books, so I'm not, I'm not counting those. I'm counting about books that you could get from a wide variety of, of Celtic scholars and well-meaning Christian scholars even. And, uh, you know, oh my God, all over the world, we're talking about the Native American Indian destruction, this, and the conquistadors and, and, the, and the Maya and the Aztecs, that, right? And, and, and the destruction of these people over here and over there. Well, hold on. Why is the destruction of the Druids a bloody footnote? Nothing more than that in most books. A, a paragraph is what you get in some of the finest books on this subject. And I just went, this is unbelievable. They're wailing and crying about, you know, the spotted oil or whatever, you know, and, and this monumental massacre that affected not just the time that it happened, but the rest of the fate of the West. The whole Western world's, you know, traditions and history is affected by the destruction of the servants of truth and the servants of light. And all the sorcery we know today, both politically and historically and institutionally and educationally, all of these obscenities arise out of the destruction of this class of the servants of truth. And that's a footnote in most people's book, a genocide of unimaginable proportions, and you're wondering about some Timbuktu, you know, a catastrophe that took place and not this. That's unacceptable to me. So my Irish blood did really get up at that. And I said, this, no, no way. No way am I going to allow that. So it's, it's not just a question that there was like... Um uh, uh, omissions or mistakes made. This is a deliberate kind of um, uh, no culting of history, I suppose, which we can we can expand on more when we get into the Druids for sure. And I mean, you made the point there that you know you need to go off road and to kind of go into the mythology to to get to the bottom of things and try to piece things together from that. Or um, so I mean, how far back does the m m mythology go? And I mean, how important is it to understand the history of Ireland? Well, even officially, it's, it goes back to what they call the flood. Uh, they do think of it as a mythological cycle, so none of the academics are actually accepting that any of this happened. But if we, I, I believe, you see, the key to what I do, right, people open a book of mine or, whatever, or go to the website, they're never going to make any progress unless they understand one fact. I accept the myths and legends of the whole world as fact, not in a stupid way, but in a, uh, in a rational way. So... This already is going to uh, this is already going to distinguish you from those people who really make a hard dis, uh, a categorical difference between what we call fact and what we call you know uh, mythology. To me, the mythology is fact, 
and it actually contains more fact than we can even imagine. So when the ancient, uh, or even when the academics are talking about the flood in this more sort of a generic and general way, I'm looking at that being the deluge, just as Commons Beaumont instructed people, and just like Ignatius Donnelly, that's why I mentioned those names earlier, it's very important to do so, because they factor in Atlantis, they factor in the destruction of the old world, the, cat the cataclysm that then sent people to Britain, Britain being a remnant, you see, and this has impact then on what Plato said, because in Plato you don't get that he's talking about the Northwest, but actual hands-on testing, hands-on geology, you know, and all of this other speculation, even the astronomical aspect, maybe we can touch on that later, definitely leads us not to places speculated by Plato, but up further up, past the pillars of Hercules, which actually is a giant's causeway and, and Fingal's cave over in Scotland. The pillars of Hercules are not to be found in the Mediterranean. They're not part of Gibraltar or whatever. They are, they are the famous, well-known to ship people at the time. The ancient mariners knew exactly where the pillars of Hercules were because the Hercules in Celtic mythology is Oma or Ogma, O-G-M-A, God of Strength. And his pillars, later reprised in the Finn McCool story, uh, this is how mythologies happen, uh, are the pillars of Hercules, or, or the, as I said, the uh, Giant's Causeway. So the actual Atlantis is in that direction. Well, look, it doesn't take a rocket scientist then to work out where it was. It's part of uh, the Northern Hemisphere, and that includes England and Ireland, Scandinavia, and even possibly Greenland, uh, Iceland, and part of the Arctic. And as a matter of fact, geology accepts that there is a sunken continent called Appalachia right, right there. That there is indeed not only just devastated forests going on for thousands upon thousands of miles. Uh, I write about all of this in the Atlantis book and also in the Irish Origin, you see, and that there is indeed remnants of a culture. And then about a few years ago, now we're not talking many years ago, it couldn't be more than 10 years ago when the Natural, National Geographic did a deep survey of all of the coastlands of Britain, they confirm cataclysm, not uniformitarianism. So all the uniformitarianism, all the classic geology was completely dashed. I have the, I have the facts of this in various places and on the Irish Origins website. And yet that again was airbrushed. We never saw the consequences. Of, we never saw the follow-up of that extremely expensive National Geographic survey of the coastlines of England and Commons Beaumont was absolutely validated that it, all the shelves that you can't see because the water covers it, but they did the sonar, they've done this uh, with a new technology, and they discovered that the shelves show absolute 100% evidence of cataclysm, not a slow, gradual, uniformitarian, you know, motion as your Lyles and your Gizes and your various and your Geekies and all of these original cheating, lying academics, right, who knew what was going on, but couldn't for the sake of their careers admit whether it came to nosophilia or it came to you know the, the movement and the strange behavior of animals or these woolly mammoths, all the things that one has to get into, right? All the strangeness of it. But getting back to your point, ancient mythology had already talked all about it. Facts are catching up in the 20th and 21st century. My God, ancient prehistoric cultures already told you what was what. But it was shunted aside, laughed off as fairy folk tale and mythology, and we lost such a canon of knowledge by that. And, and we're still reeling from the shock. We're miles behind where we should be because of the negation and the dismissal, you see, of fairy folk, what was, it was laughingly called fairy folk tale. And Ireland's culture is rich in it, one of the richest, and yet we've let it rot to our own bloody detriment. The, the, the bestial symbols being used in the music business and in the corporate world today. Dick Gregory, the famous comedian, says, pay attention to Hollywood movies very carefully, for they normally tell you in a subliminal and occult way what they're going to do. Of course, we noted earlier that the caduceus of Hermes is the worldwide symbol for the medical profession, but here the World Health Organization uses clearly the symbol of the serpent. And in fact, our symbol for money, the American dollar bill, the symbol is this, two parallel lines vertically piercing the letter S. But in fact, that is a very ancient symbol. 
here in a table of ancient symbols, we find the dollar sign, or what looks like the dollar sign, but that sign was originally known as a scourge. Now, if you look up the word scourge in a dictionary, it will tell you that it is a whip or a bond or a lash for brutalizing and keeping people in order, for keeping slaves in order, the scourge of the world. current structure only works with time-independent processes, such as a Markov process. Since a time can be reversed there, this is not possible with a development process. Every engineer knows that you cannot deduce from the final state to the beginning. Just as little as you can still recognize the horse-drawn carriage in a modern automobile. The assumption of an initial state belongs to the realm of belief in a religion. Besides, what time is valid in the cosmos? Time is relative, so you have no absolute start. Religions are static, but our knowledge grows dynamically with our failure and our successes in mastering nature. In short, the development of technology the technical replication of elements of nature is the ultimate proof of our understanding of how they work. How can we then succeed in reconciling belief in religion with science? Our faith ends where knowledge begins. Fewer and fewer functions of nature are expected of gods today, and more and more functions are recognized, and thus become the responsibility of mankind. A hundred years ago, George Lemaitre created blue and ultraviolet light, even though they are cool at a temperature around 950K. This is further evidence that we are looking at a mix of an electrical red anode glow and coronal ultraviolet blue end of the spectrum. There are no seasons, no tropics and no ice caps. A planet does not have to rotate, its axis can point in any direction and its orbit can be eccentric and you'll still get this beautiful even temperature over the whole body. The radiant energy received by the planet will be strongest at the blue and red ends of the spectrum, so photosynthesis, which relies on red light, would uh, be very active. The skylight would be a pale purple, which maybe is referred to by the classical purple dawn of creation. And I know that in Canberra we have this new arboretum, which is fantastic, and all of the new trees that are being planted are put in red plastic to start with. And I asked the, uh, the head of the arboretum why they did that, and he said the plants grow much better in red light. Water molecules dominate the spectra of brown dwarfs, so you want to know where the Earth's water came from. The light on Earth was dim and purplish amid a continuous mist of water. No other bodies in the system were visible. And this is what uh, Dave mentioned uh, yesterday. This explains the abundant water on Earth and many satellites of the gas giant planets and the rings of Saturn. And the red light, warmth and water was ideally suited for giant ferns. It explains the gigantic lush vegetation found at the poles, fossilised as coal. Last thing last night, which was this flaring red dwarf. So this tendency to flare up is a problem. The reason for this is, that, as I said, the red stars don't have the current regulation afforded by uh, the bright photosphere. So the response of a red star to a sudden electrical disturbance in their environment is to shed charged matter in a flare-up. They may also change in apparent size as the anode glow accommodates to the electrical environment. I think this would account for the great dyings in the geological record and the episodic deposit of vast sediment and mineral layers on the Earth and on other bodies too. Every body that's been looked at is layered. What's more, it explains for the first time the oceans of salty water on Earth. Comets cannot be responsible because they have little or no water and little or no sodium chloride. Now, just see how much of this I want to show you because uh, we saw this yesterday. So I might skip.
this is re referring to that uh, super flare you saw yesterday. And you remember the uh, astrophysicist said uh, anyone who was on a planet orbiting that star at the time would be having a very bad day. Well, I think the Earth has had, had its bad days and they're reflected in the geological record. So we'll skip that. 